So glad that, that you can be our guest. Uh, and today we kick off our new, uh, our new series called Shema. Shema, right? Everybody, we're all going to say it, Shema. Shema. Man, you guys, you see, you've already got it, right? And, here, and it's, it's all about family discipleship. And whether you're a family of one or you have a big family, you have a, a young family, an old family, whatever it is, uh, there's something for you. Because today, I, we're, we're going to talk about advice. Advice. And, and not just advice, but I think all of us, right? All of, most of us, probably all of us, have at one point failed to take really good advice. I mean, sometimes you knew it, right? Sometimes you knew as soon as you didn't take that advice, you immediately regretted it, right? Like when you were a kid, you know, don't put that butter knife in the electrical outlet. It was pretty, pretty immediate regretting of taking the advice, right? I don't know if your parents, were your parents like my parents and they would say things to you like, uh, hey, mister, if you keep that up, you're cruising for a bruising. And you know what happens, right? You just kept cruising, or at least I did. I just kept cruising, and eventually, I would get the bruising. Uh, whether it was from a flip-flop, if my mom was in the, the, the one giving the bruising, or, if, or the bell, if my dad was giving the bruising. Right? And honestly, I should have taken the advice. It was advice to make me not a terrible person. But it's not just little kids that don't take advice. You ever met a teenager that didn't take really good advice? I know that's a shocker. No. Um, have, were you ever a teenager that didn't take really good advice? I, I know I did, right? I remember as my English teacher, Patty Youngblood, she said, Aaron, you know, you're very creative and you should really focus on developing your writing skills. It could really help you one day. I didn't take that advice because what did she know? Nothing. That's what she knew, or at least that's what I thought. So in, instead of learning how to ride in high school or, or even really in college, I didn't really do that. In, I, I think I wrote five or six papers in college. Uh, I had to learn in seminary. I had to learn how to ride in seminary when, when the stakes were much higher. Uh, and not only that, but, but by the time you're in grad school, to, to learn how to ride, the only person that would spend time to teach me how to ride well was my wife. I mean, she, she knew. She knew we couldn't afford to drop out or for me to fail classes, and, and, and our whole future kind of hinged on, on this, you know, this path. And, and so she had to teach me how to write. And so a little, a little aside, if you really want to test the limits of your marriage, just have one spouse teach the other one how to write. I mean, and then I mean, throw in a couple of uh, little kids and two full-time jobs, and, and then your whole future staked on how well the one teaches the other how to write. Uh, and and you'll, you'll, man, you'll really test the limits of your marriage. Or, or you cannot do that and just remain happy in your marriage. It's fine either way. Um, but we all have advice that we wish we would have taken. Maybe yours was educational advice, uh, you know, like mine, right? Or, or like Susan Shapiro, who, who teaches ironically enough, uh, writing at Columbia. She says, she writes, I was the type of mediocre student I now have disdain for. As a freshman, I cared about three things, my friends, my boyfriend, and my poetry. Or in reality, I cared about what my boyfriend thought of my friends and what my friends thought of him and what they all thought about my poetry about him. She says, I really wish, I really wish I would have listened to the advice of all of my teachers and taken my education more seriously early in life. Or maybe you took your education seriously, but you, you wish you would have taken that career advice. I wish, you know, I wish I would have taken that career advice from my, from my boss or, you know, my mom or my dad or my mom or my dad who was my boss. I wish I would have taken that advice. Or, or that piece of relationship advice that you, you really wish you would have taken seriously much, much earlier, right? I mean, I mean, of course you read it in a book, and then someone told you, and then a counselor told you, but you wouldn't listen, because what do they know? All three of them surely don't know much. So, if you have ever, if you have ever 
been given great advice and ignored it, or flat out refused to follow it, any time in your life, would you just raise your hand? If you've ever done that, and look around. We have a lot of people that are truthful in this place, and some that aren't. That's okay. They didn't raise it. No. Look, we're, we're all in good company. We are all in good company because every single one of us at some point has failed to follow good or even great advice. You see, here's the thing. So the Shema is divine advice. It's divine advice on family discipleship, meaning how do you function as a follower of God who is also a member of a family? How do you communicate this with, 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 within your family, spouse, kids, uh, extended family, or even your community? How do you live as a person in a family of faith, in, in, a, in a community as a person of faith? You see, the Shema is advice on how to do that. Now, now it's written as a command, and, and we could, it's, it, it is a command. But I say it's advice, and you know, I talk about it as advice, because each and every one of us, right, you and I, we have the opportunity to either accept the advice or do what we all have done at some point in our life and refuse to take it. No one is... Is, you know, no one is forcing you to, against your will, to do these things. And just like any other advice, you will be able to, throughout this, you'll be able to find two or three or 20 or a thousand excuses why you can't follow this advice or why it doesn't apply to you or why you just simply won't take it. You see, but God knows this about you. He knows this about me. He, he knew this about me in 11th grade English. <laughs> he knows this about you whenever that great advice that you were given that you should. He knows this. And he knows that in reality, that many more times than I would like to admit, I have refused to listen to great advice. He knows this about all of us. And so when he gives us this important piece of, of information, this command for us to follow, this ad advice from God. I mean, you can't get much better than that, right? You're getting advice from God on how to live as a follower of God in a family and in a community. So when he goes and does this, when he goes and gives this, the whole structure of the Shema, this, there's a command before the command, the command is not found at the first. There is a command, if you open your Bibles to Deuteronomy 6, and in verse 4, you find a command before the command, right? The advice before the advice. Now, this is where we get the name of this series, Shema, right? It's also the name of this passage because the passage is referred to as the Shema, right? Many times, many times when you are studying a, an important passage in the Bible, it will be referred to by a name that will sound kind of funny because typically important passages are named after the first word of the passage. And usually it's from a different language, Greek, Hebrew, right? I don't, Aramaic maybe, but not usually. And in this case, the Shema was written 3,500 years ago, uh, near the end of the Israelites wandering around in the wilderness. And, and this passage is very important to the Israelite people. It's very important to, to, to Jewish people. They, they would recite it at least twice a day. Even today, Jews, devout Jews, will still recite this passage at least twice a day. They will recite it to their kids at least once a day. And they will even recite this passage on their deathbed. It's so important. This passage reads, in Hebrew it reads, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Or in English, hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is the command before the command. This isn't even, this isn't even the most important piece. This is not, he, he says, listen to this thing, I'm going to tell you. This is, he's saying, this is, this is important. I need you to understand what I'm saying, right? This is the command before the command. This isn't even a command. 
This is the attention getter. Now, the word Shema, it has three kind of a range of meaning. That can mean about three different things, right? One means you can simply like hear, like audibly. You know, take the, take the cotton out of your ears. Hear. You know, can you hear me? Or it can mean to obey. It can mean to heed, right? It can mean hear. It can mean hear. Hear or heed. But in this case, Shema means, hey, means pay attention. Pay attention to what I'm about to say to you. Listen for understanding. Listen for understanding. God is saying, listen to understand what I'm about to say to you. Because what I'm about to say to you is very important. Pay attention. Hear this. When I'm on the football field, and the kids are talking, right? It's my, it's my second passion, right? Yelling at 13-year-olds right now. Football season, we're like a few weeks in. And when the kids get rowdy and I'll say, hey, they know, right? We're about to do some unpleasant things if I don't pay attention, if I don't listen to understand what he's about to say, because the hey is the attention getter. And this is what this is. He says, listen for understanding. And then he addresses his audience, hear, O Israel, Israel. Now, I'm going to skip over this for now, but but he tells his audience to listen to understand what he's about to tell them. But instead of going right into this, he reveals who he is. He reveals his audience, and then he reveals something about him. Now, Now, God uses two words to describe himself. Shema Israel. Adonai Eloheinu. He uses two words. He uses two words. Now, now the, now the first word, I can't even really tell you what it is in Hebrew because no one alive today knows how to say this divine name of God with any amount of certainty. It's the name, it's the name of God that God reveals to Moses. Right? You, you've heard some forms of it. Maybe you, know, you might have heard the, the, the word Yahweh. That, that may, but probably not, is really the right way to, to pronounce it. And you would never hear a Jewish person pronounce that. You'd never hear them say that. In in, in fact, they were so afraid to take God's name in vain, they eventually stopped saying this word altogether. And so instead of saying this word that actually is there, they would say the word Adonai. And now we translate Adonai as Lord if you have an old King James Bible or, or, or I think a, a couple other translations, they'll put LORD in there in all caps. When you see LORD in there in all caps in certain translations, that is this word that is translate, that, that, that the Hebrews would use the word in, in the place Adonai, in the place of, and we say LORD. Now, now this speaks to the eminence of God. The eminence of God. He, because when he's, he's describing himself in two words, and, and the first word is Adonai, speaks of his eminence. Now, now when, when we think of something as imminent, right, you're in imminent danger, that means it is close in time. And so God, to, God to, des- to describe God as imminent means that he is close to his people. You see, he reveals this over and over and over again. I am with you. I am with you. He demonstrates this. uh, These these Israelites have been wandering around the desert for 40 years. He says, listen, I am with you all the time. I am with you in a pillar of fire at night and a pillar of smoke during the day. I am with you. I am close to you. I am close to you. And so it is the imminent speaks to the imminence of God. See, God consistently tells his people that he is close to them. He is an imminent God. He is near. But then he also uses a word, this word Elihenu, which is a form of the word Elohim. Genesis 1.1 starts out, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, Elohim. (laughs) Elohim speaks of the transcendence of God. Now, transcendence means that he is utterly not earthly. He is not like us. He is not, he, he is, is heavenly, right? We're, we're earthly, he's heavenly. We are weak, he is powerful. 
We are temporary. He is infinite. And so God, when he, he calls attention, he says, hey, listen. Listen, I am the God who is both near to you. I am the God who is imminent, who is near. And I am the God who is transcendent, who is nothing like you. I am, I am far. I am both of those things at the same time. But not only that, he uses another word. So he says, Adonai Echad. Okay? So Adonai, right, it's the same word. And then Echad means one. It's a, it's a little ambiguous. You know, Lord one. <laughs> it's a little ambiguous, but it describes God. Now, now we deal with it. You know, we don't like ambiguity a lot of times when we read the Bible, but, but we deal with ambiguity all the time. If I were to say a woman gives birth in the U.S. every 48 seconds, you could say, oh, a lot of kids are born. Or you could say, man, she must really be tired. That's an ambiguous phrase. It doesn't describe wh- how many women, right? It just says a woman. That's, that's, amb- that's ambiguous. You see, now there is a way to say that a, a, a more clearly, you know. A child is born every 48 seconds in America by, you know, mostly different women. (laughs) But what you want to say, right? Sometimes you want to say the thing, you want to say it in an ambiguous way. Sometimes you want to say it in an ambiguous way, right? Uh, You know, you've heard it said, hey, whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. It's a little ambiguous. And you say things like that on purpose, right? Now, there are two ways to interpret Lord one. There's two ways to interpret this phrase. One, it could mean that God alone, meaning that he is the one and only, the the, the true God. There is none beside him. And we see this in the Ten Commandments, which is not just another book before it. It says, you will have no other gods. <laughs> In fact, you see that all over the Bible. I'm the only one you will call God. We have a unique relationship. I am God alone. I am your God alone. You see that all the time. It's, it's, in, it's in respect to the uniqueness of, of relationship. I am the only God that matters. <laughs> or I am really the only God. Or you could say you could say God alone, right? The Lord alone. Or you could say the Lord is one, <clears throat> meaning He is singular in character. He is the same forever, forever and ever. Singular in character, singular in purpose, and the singularness and character and purpose is is, is found all throughout the Old Testament, and into the New Testament. We even see this used to describe Jesus, this this singularness of character. In Hebrews 13.8, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now see, here's the neat thing about this. The neat thing about this, the, the way it was written, is you can correctly interpret it as the Lord alone or the Lord is one, and either way is fine. And moreover, in Hebrew, there are simpler ways, there are simpler ways to construct that phrase to make it say one thing or the other. There are much more concrete ways to say each of those two things. But when we run across this kind of ambiguous phrase, there is a reason it's ambiguous. So I believe that this phrase carries both meanings because both are prominent truths about God throughout the entire scope of Scripture. And so God is saying, hey, hey, listen up. I'm about to tell you something important, something you really need to pay attention to. So, so pay attention. <laughs> Pay attention. Pay attention when God tells us this important thing. He says, listen, I am, I am God, and I am the God who is far, and I am the God who is near to you. I am the God who is singular in character, and I am the only God. We see this in Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ, he's, Jesus, Christ, Jesus Christ promises us. He is imminent. He says, wherever, you know, go into the nations and make disciples. Go and make disciples of all nations. At the very end, he says, lo, I am with you always until the end of the age. I am imminent. I am close to you always. But he is also transcendent. In John 1, it says that Jesus was with God in the beginning, and through him everything that was ever created was created by him. So he is both far away and he is imminent. In fact, he's so imminent, he took on flesh. He died in our place. That's what we remembered today. And he promises us he will never leave us. And he is forever unchanging. And so when someone like that tells you, here's some advice you should take. He is able to exclusively speak to us as God. Whenever God speaks to you, your ears should perk up. Now, now some of you might be saying, listen, Aaron, that's, that's really neat stuff, right? But isn't, isn't this written to, to Israel? Isn't this written to people a long time ago? You know, hear, O Israel. And to that, I would say, that's a great question. How did you know I was about to talk about that? Now, now I would agree I would agree there are many things there are many things in the Old Testament that we Christians do not and should not follow because we are not ancient Jews. Right in the Old Testament there are a number of civil and ceremonial laws that we don't care about. You see it's no big deal if you ate shellfish last night. Not a big deal. If you were an Old Testament Jew, very big deal. Uh, you, you're allowed, if you ate shellfish last night, you're allowed to participate in worship today, and that's great. And if you walked in here with clothes made up of two different kinds of material, you can still participate. There is no exclusion for that. And I doubt, I seriously doubt that any of you did your ceremonial washing or sacrificed some kind of animal earlier this year, you were able to still participate in worship. So there's a number of laws. There's a number of these, these, these civil and ceremonial laws that we don't follow, but the moral laws of the Old Testament are timeless. Jesus even kept them and taught them. I think you see this, you see this over and over through Jesus' life. And I think that God meant that, these, these moral laws, as much then as he does today. But he says, hear, O Israel. And that can cause some problems. Hear, O Israel. Now, now, Israel is the name of someone. If you go back into, into Genesis 32, you can find a man named Jacob. Now, Jacob was a cheater, right? His name meant cheater, deceiver. That's what his name meant, and he lived up to that name, cheating his father and his brother. And now you see this all throughout Jacob's earlier part of his life, and his life does not go well because when you cheat and deceive continually, your life usually is pretty hard. And, and, and he kind of turns things around, and he's traveling back to meet his brother, and he's in, he's in the wilderness, and he gets into a wrestling match with an unnamed man. He gets into a wrestling match. Now, if you read in Genesis 32, your Bible heading will probably say, Jacob wrestles with God. And whether it was an appearance of God or whether it was the angel of God, it was God. He was either God or God's representative. And they get into a wrestling match. And they wrestle all night. And the sun was coming up, and it said that the man, the man, this unnamed man, right, this, this, this representative of God, could not overpower Jacob. So he dislocates Jacob's hip. But even with a dislocated hip, Jacob will not give up. He will not let the man go. And, and Jacob has, you know, I don't know, I'm, you know, has him in a, a rear naked chokehold or something, right? Some kind of UFC move that I don't know. And the man says, let me go, let me go. And Jacob says, I'll let you go, but you have to bless me. He knows this isn't just a normal wrestling match between two dudes. 
He knows that there's something different about this unnamed person. And so the man gives him a new name. And in Genesis 32, 28, it says, Then the man said, Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. <coughs> now read that again, okay? Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and you have struggled with humans and you have overcome. You see, I've always been under the impression that when Jacob finally got his life together, right? When he finally started fighting, he finally stopped fighting against God. When he finally submitted, when he finally tapped out, that's when God blessed him. But that's the exact opposite of what happened. Jacob wrestles with God and he doesn't give up. He doesn't tap out. He doesn't cry uncle. He wrestles with God, right? And he wrestles with humans and he overcome. He overcame, right? And, and, and that's what Israel means. It means uh, he, you contend with God. You struggle with God and you overcame. Uh, but this, this is not just you. This name, Israel, is not just used for Jacob. It's used for the whole nation, but it's also used in a much broader sense in Galatians 3.29. It says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So as a Christian, as a follower of God, as a follower of Jesus, you and I, we are heirs of Abraham. Just like Jacob was an heir of Abraham. We, just like Israel <laughs> who was also named Jacob, was an heir of Abraham. But, but it is says, it's said even more explicitly in Galatians 6.16. It's, it's, it's talking about living by faith, by, 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 the, by the, the gospel of grace. And in Galatians 6.16, it says, Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule. Talking about the, the gospel of grace. To the Israel of God. Paul is addressing the church as the Israel of God. We are the Israel of God. And just like what that name meant, Jacob's name meant something about him. In, in the Shema, God's name meant something about him. This name means something about us, and it means something about you. If you belong to Christ, if you treasure Christ, if you revere Christ in your heart as Lord, you are part of what Paul calls the Israel of God. You were one who contended with God and overcame. That should be, that should be encouraging. See, Paul, Paul says this a few times. He says it in different ways. In Romans 8, he says it this way in verse 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. If you are a follower of God, if you, are a follow, if you believe in Jesus, you are an overcomer. You are more than a conqueror. You are the Israel of God. We are the Israel of God, the children of Abraham. And God is speaking to us. 3,500 years later, he speaks to us. Hey, listen up, those of you who are more than conquerors. Listen up, those of you who have contended, who have struggled with God and have overcome. Listen up. Now, now, there may be a number of commands in the Old Testament that absolutely do not speak to us, but this isn't one. It is like God is saying, listen, I know you. I know that you have so many other things on your mind right now. I know that you have so many distractions, you have so many things pulling for your attention, but I need you to hear this. I need you to focus. This isn't just noise, this is straight from God. And God is saying, listen, listen to this advice that I'm about to give to you. It's great advice because I'm God, right? I'm the, I'm the creator. It's great advice because I'm, I'm God who created everything and understand how it all works, but it is great advice also because I am the God who is near to you and I know you. It is great advice because I care about you. It is great, it is great advice because it is from God. Now, if you aren't the kind of person who, 
takes advice. And there's a lot of us. If you aren't the kind of person that takes advice, you should take this advice. <laughs> you should take this advice. Right? Take this advice. You are more than a conqueror. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are an overcomer. Right? You, you have contended and overcome. But if you aren't used to taking advice, let me tell you, it's a learned skill. It's a learned skill to not simply dismiss advice, even great advice from people that you know, know things that you don't know. And so you have to practice at it. You have to work at it. You see, for many of us, taking advice doesn't come naturally because we're so smart. And so you have to listen you have to make the decision that I will take advice from God at least. That maybe you want to start becoming that kind of person, right? And I will tell you, there are lots and lots and lots of great advice, right? In the form of commands, in the form of loving language, in the form of warnings, in the form of redemption, all throughout the Bible. And so if you're not the kind of person that takes advice like that, then you can become. And one of the easiest ways to become a person who takes advice from God is to start reading what he would have to say to you. And one of the ways that we want to do, we want to help you do that by encouraging you to read through what Scripture says, what the Bible says, because that is how God reveals himself. It is how God reveals what he wants from you, what he, his, his, his hopes and his dreams and his plans and his warnings for you. And so we believe that the primary way that God speaks to us is through the Bible. So we, so we create a reading plan, right? Some of you, you, know, you have your phones, right? If you have not downloaded the Grace Church app, Go ahead and do it. Go, you know, download the Grace Church app. It's free. And, and when you open it up, you're going to see all kinds of neat stuff. Uh, but see, here it is, right? You're going to see it look like that. You're going to see baptism videos up top that you can watch anytime you want. And when you go to Bible, there's a reading plan, and it starts today, and we're going we're gonna to restart it tomorrow. So it'll be the exact same thing tomorrow. And it's going to it's 90 days. It's 90 days to take you through a broad scope of scripture. You're not going to read through all of it. You're going to read, you know, a little bit every day. And it's going to take you through the whole scope of scripture. Now, the other thing that's kind of neat in there is is pretty regularly you are also going to read the Shema. The whole thing uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. So, you, you know, you'll see that tomorrow it's Genesis chapters 1 and 2 and the Shema. And so I encourage you, download that and read it, right? Read it on your lunch break. It, it, it will read it to you. It will, if you go in, you, you hit, I'm going to just want to read for Sunday. You can hit the little button at the bottom and it'll read it to you. Oh, hot dog, it worked, right? Now if I just get it to stop, that's way better, right? And it'll only even show what you have to read. It'll only even show what you have to read so you, there's no confusion. If you, if you have Bluetooth in your car, have it read it to you on the way to work, right? If you wake up early, read it, do your, read it during your devotion. While you're getting ready in the morning, you know, turn your phone on and do that, right? If you, hey, if you want to read a paper Bible, perfect, do that as well. Read it on your lunch break. Listen to it on your way home instead of yelling at people in traffic. I mean, not y'all would do that. But other people, you should really encourage them to do that. Will you listen to the advice that God gives? Because that's the, kind of, that, that's the, that's the real question today. Because God's about to tell us something so important, of such significance, because I, I can think of very few things that are more important than your relationship with God and how it relates to your family. I can think of few things more important than that. And God's about to give you this advice, but he says, hey, listen up, because you've got to be the kind of person that takes advice, that will listen to what he says, or else... It is just noise. So will you listen? Will you shma? 
Will you listen to understand? Will you pay attention? Will you listen to what God has to say to you about what it takes to live out your faith in the context of your family and your community? Will you do that? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you you love us. You get our attention. (laughs) You know that we have all turned down really good advice. We've all ignored it or refused to take it or and for whatever reason. But God, give us, give us the ability to, to hear what's going on, to hear what you are saying, to pay attention and listen for understanding as you give us these commands. Father, help us to shema. <laughs> And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you guys, and I'll see you next week.